Riders, welcome back to eTalk, where we only talk to cool people doing cool things on e-bikes. And on this episode, we have Tracy Mosley. Tracy does not need an introduction, but I'm gonna give her one anyway. She's such a superstar. Seven times British national champion, 16 times downhill World Cup wins, two times World Cup overall winner, one downhill world championships, 15 Enduro World Series wins, and three Enduro World Cup wins back to back, and the winner of the last EWS electric round in Italy by four minutes. And before we get into the podcast with Tracy, a massive shout out to Ride Concepts. They are the official sponsor of this episode. If you don't know much about Ride Concepts, they're the new kids on the block, about 18 months old, making amazing riding shoes. And these are my Wildcats. They are kind of like a free riding, soft enduro shoe, a high cut. They look epic and Sam Pilgrim loves them. And riders, if you're thinking about getting a new riding shoe, definitely check out Ride Concepts. Now, on to the podcast with Tracy Mosley. Riders, I hope you enjoy it. So Tracy, welcome to eTalk. It's absolute pleasure to have you on. And uh, I'm a massive fan. <laughs> and congratulations <laughs> on the last EWS electric, uh, well, maybe overall win, but the last win in Italy by four minutes. It's amazing. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, great to great to be here virtually, obviously. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's been. Uh, thankfully, we did get to do a few races in 2020, and it was super cool to be part of that first ever kind of e-bike enduro world series. So really, really, really special for me to yeah try something new once again in my career. Definitely. And tell me, uh, so you you got second in the first e the first race, and then first in the second race. Does that mean, and you won by four minutes, does that mean you're the overall or they didn't, they didn't, they didn't do, an do overall? any overalls this year because it was just those two races. Yeah. There was going to be more, but they got cancelled then. So they decided before we even started racing, there was going to be no overall titles in 2020. It was just okay. going to be individual race wins. So, yeah, I mean, and also the um, Melanie who won the first round didn't race in Italy um, because it was also, she was racing the, we call them normal muscle bike women call it normal yeah, yeah. normal enduro race and yeah. the the kind of practice times overlap so okay um so yeah if you put the both races together then yes i definitely was the most successful out of the two um but that wasn't part of the the 2020 series so, so hopefully 2021 we'll have more races and there will be a kind of world title to to go for so, so that, that was my next question you definitely signed up for next year um yeah i think so i think um i mean i guess my part of my kind of job as well is i'm not really you know a full-time bike racer anymore i'm kind of working for trek as logistics um travel organizer athlete liaison all sorts of things um uh, with their trek factory teams across enduro downhill and cross country so um fairly busy with that job and my kind of racing part is is a bit of an add-on and something that i've just still enjoy still want to push myself and try something new and and the whole e-bike thing for them is a big part of um, of their bike range. And also the racing side is something that they kind of asked me to to get involved with and pioneer, I guess, for, for the sport. So I do, will definitely do the European rounds. I definitely won't be traveling to the US to do any of the e-bike stuff over there if there is any. Um, but I'll certainly be as, as many as possible um, in Europe next year. That's the plan. You're still pretty good at it, though, I'd have to say. I watched that. Yeah, I mean. Like, you're still pretty good at it. <laughs> Yeah, I guess you hopefully, I was hoping I would never forget how to race and ride my bike. Um, and I definitely, it, it's just different for me now, I guess, not having it be, I've spent so many years with racing and training being my ultimate focus. You know, my everyday was around getting fitter and faster and better on my bike. Whereas now with work being the priority and being a mum, my bike riding is certainly my my outlet for my own kind of relief from life and uh, the enjoyment and pleasure and it's also something that I still really want to be competitive at but it's certainly it, it just feels very different to me now to race because it's it's not my focus um, of my and it's I'm not yeah. being able to put the same amount of time and effort in as I you know had in the past so I feel like I'm I'm coming at the races slightly uh in less in less a good a good kind of place as I have in the past but equally having fun and enjoying something that's new you know the whole e-bike thing for me is still 
really quite new. It's oh, yeah. the racing aspects new for everyone still as well. So um, yeah, it's, it's exciting. Exciting for part of it. For me, it's um, it's super interesting the fact that you know you you dominated in downhill and then you dominated in EWS and now this new category and it's it's um I, I think I love it because you know you and Nico Vurio you're back you know back racing and I think it's a a really interesting uh development in the sport I really think it's um I'm interested to see where it's going to go um I wanted to just go all the way back and to talk about when you first rode a bike and when you actually first realized you had something that you could, you know, you had something, you could be a profession. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I grew up on a farm, uh, still living here, still actually living with my brother, not far away. Mum and dad, not far away either. So we, none of us have gone far. And my brother was probably the, the person that certainly got me riding my bike and probably was the one that, believed in me and saw potential way way before I ever did um I used to just ride because he was riding with his friends so he always used to ride with the boys just tried to keep up do whatever they were doing and I I guess my first memory is is of doing like a little dual slalom down one of our fields with just some friends and I just turned up on a whatever bike I had some big 21 inch frame probably thing and um and was going as fast and if not beating some of my brother's friends and he was just like that's not normal so what, how are you doing that <laughs> and it, and so it took a good few years for me to kind of get the enthusiasm to actually go and do a race and I did a, a local slalom race at the Malvern Hills Classic which is a big bike festival that we had um in the UK here in the early 90s and um I went there and and won the women's dual slalom and beat at the time you know our best kind of downhill races wow. um and it was then when my brother said, I told you. And then even the guy who was running the race said, you really should have a go at this, you know. And then eventually that kind of gave, spurred me on to then race um, the Junior Downhill Series in the UK. I think it was in 95, probably 96 was that first year. So, yeah, it, it took me a while to realise. And I just, it was something that I never had, yeah, wasn't never, you look at kids now and you feel like it's fine, this planned trajectory of they're going to be this superstar and they've been, doing stuff from age three or whatever and it was not at all that for me it was I enjoyed all other sports as well at school and just happened to fall into biking because of my my brother really were you were you really good at other sports as well so or just I was always I loved sports I was always I was in every kind of school team I played a lot of hockey netball was my kind of go-to thing I really enjoyed and played at a, a high standard but not you know not ever kind of anything county or national just at school and playing in local clubs um, and I was always pretty good and competitive and captain of the team. So it was just did loads of sport as well as music, did all sorts of things. So yeah. I was never like super focused into um, into one thing either. Um, and I wasn't particularly athletic or I hated. That's why downhill to me it was the f- the first thing that took my fancy because I didn't yeah. have to ride my bike up the hill. I could just yeah. basically get to the top and, and roll down the other side, which is that speed and adrenaline was a thing that kind of hooked me rather than the the physical exercise part of it um right. but that's changed since i think as you grow older things do change but certainly at the start i was quite a lazy kid hated yeah. pedaling i can understand that definitely <laughs> um so when was your first major win and how did that sort of change you in a way like you know that i mean i'd imagine when you're getting to the top actually winning that mindset changes you know like that you're actually a player you know yeah i think so for me, the standout one would be my first ever World Cup downhill win. Um, was in Fort William in 2002. So it was the first ever World Cup we had in Great Britain as well. Um, and that I, at that point, I was racing World Cups, but I was just scraping inside the top 10. I wasn't like really ever in contention to win. So that win at Fort William definitely kind of came out of the blue for everyone, not just me. Mm. Um, and that was the first like, wow, I just won a World Cup. Um, and it took me a long time until I kind of won another one and became consistent that, you know, winning them. I didn't win the world cup overall until 2006. So that was a five years later. Yeah. Um, and I didn't win the world championships until 2010. So a good eight years later. So it, it certainly was a bit of a slow burn for me in terms of actually finding that pace and consistency in downhill. Um, but I think that was the kind of the, the turning point when I actually suddenly had a number one plate on my bike at the next world cup. And I was just like, wow, I've just, just won a world cup and kind of, the first ever British woman to win a World Cup downhill race. Lots of like firsts for me. So it was 
yeah that's I would say is the the time when I actually realized I was capable of doing it and it's just as with lots of sport it doesn't just happen overnight it's a, a slow process to actually get to the top of the sport yeah most definitely that would have been a big almost a shock if you weren't if you were just in the top 10 and then winning one like you imagine, oh, like watching now, uh, I watch the world, the downhill a lot, and, you know, you see the top three or four, it's a shock if anyone else gets, you know, like, you know who's going to more or less be in the top 10. And, yeah. Uh, well, that's... Uh, that's it awesome. was a little bit like, you, if you watch this year's World Champs in Leo Gang, yep. you know, no disrespect to the winners. And certainly, I think, in the, in Reese, obviously, for me, working for Trek, it's been amazing for us to have a winner, but you wouldn't have put him as a... Uh, you know, a, a, a real favourite the week, you know, a few days before that race. And the same with the w- women's race. So it was oh, when definitely. the conditions are like that, and I had a little bit of that in Fort William in that first year, the mud was just horrendous. And it was like literally who could stay on their bike down the trail. So I think, you know, in some ways, sometimes good luck and you just getting it right in the day plays into your hands. And for me, that was that same situation. I came away with my first World Cup win. So it was... Sometimes the, when the conditions are like that, you, you get those kind of breakthrough performances. And like, I'm hoping now for Reese, that's the catalyst for him to realise that actually you can, you can do this. And that's the thing. Sometimes you just need that kind of that break or that opening. And I think that I, was mine. I've been watching Reese for the last couple of years. That kid, not only did he ride amazing on the weekend, he's been riding so good for the last like 18 months. I've just oh yeah. And seen if you him, watch any of his videos, it's in the mud, so isn't good. it? It's, he's so it's good. always in the mud, slopping yeah. around. So yeah. when it was like that, you did think, oh, here we go. This could be a good shot. Yeah, yeah. No, he. It's a shame he had. He took an accident uh, on the second. He took a concussion or something. So that was a shame. I was yeah. hoping to see him go back to back. Yeah, um, I think he almost could actually. Confidence yeah. was high for sure. No, definitely. So you know, you've had a massive career that spanned quite a long time what would be your standout win such a hard one but I still the enduro and downhill for me are two so so very different things and so I get such different kind of satisfaction and pleasure from the two different careers but if I had to take one actual win then it's still going to be that world champs downhill win the first one no in 2010 the world championships Uh, okay Yep. And more for two reasons. One, it, it was a long time coming. I would really have been second at World Champs so many times. Um, and the main reason just being the World Championships and that coveted rainbow jersey that you win and you get to wear for 12 months yeah. is just such an iconic piece of cycling as a, you know, as a sport, not just mountain biking. You know, that, that jersey is the same in road, in track, in it, it's just an awesome thing. I think I've grown up having seen that and seeing that world champion wearing rainbow striped helmet, socks, shoes. You get the whole deal for a year and you can wear that and it's only yeah. you can wear it. And that was the dream to, 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 be, to have one of those hanging on my wall. Um, so to actually finally do that in 2010 and stand on the podium, put the jersey on your shoulders and listen to your national anthem, pretty damn cool. And I don't think anything probably quite beats that actual moment of that the memory of me kind of standing on the podium and getting that jersey for the first time it's put on your shoulders and you stand there look down and think yes that's mine yeah so pretty cool. that's uh, that's interesting like uh, as an outsider obviously i've never raced anything like this but for me i think I, I love the world the world champs but i always think the overall winner like the overall world cup winner is like a bigger sort of uh achievement because you've you've showed the consistency but it's interesting to see that you you know that the actual wearing that and and the prestige of that is is worth more you know that's interesting. yeah I mean I fully agree and I always think the world cup and that's why if I'm honest now my my enduro career was probably more satisfying for me because it was consistency over three years back to back so many races hours and hours of racing and time on your bike like from an athlete's perspective and what I achieved doing that, I probably have more satisfaction from. Yep. But as an actual like standout experience and feeling like inside of just like that jersey is still something special. And even now, if I see it hanging on the wall, it's like, that's cool. That's mine. I've got one. And I think it's just because it's something that's just so historic within, within cycling, I guess. Um, mm. And for me, it would be awesome if we, if we could have had something like that for Enduro. Um, but also the one day race also creates that extra element of 
stress, hype, build up tension. And actually that's something that I think is also adds to the, the excitement of winning it as well, because it is a full pressured one day. You can't just afford to make a mistake. Whereas the, the series, you get a chance to kind of have an off day or, you know, that consistency pays off, but to actually get it all right on that one day isn't so crucial. Mm. So I think that that's adds to it as well. They're just, they are different. That's what I said from the start. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I have been uh, stalking you a little bit doing my research and I heard an interview talking about the state of downhill at the moment. And it's kind of got, we're all riding 29 wheels now. It's got faster. It has got a bit more dangerous. We are seeing more serious injuries. You know, uh, how? what's your feel on, you know, if you were to take the reins, what would you do to make things different at the moment? Um, it's a tough one because I think with downhill at the moment, it's very much driven by by TV, by Red Bull coverage, and that's what's driving the sport in terms of fan base, people's careers, pay packets. You know, the sport is being driven by, you know, by us being able to watch it on TV and creating that fan base and creating that excitement. The reality of how you do that is by having a course that looks good to be shot on camera, to be able to be filmed, to be able to cover. So, you know, if you were to go back to a traditional old kind of old style World Cup down course that maybe six, seven minutes long, mostly in the forest, you would need hundreds of cameras to be able to be able yeah. to capture that whole whole track, which is, you know, financially impossible. So now what they're, they're trying to do is create shorter, shorter racing, so faster, more intense, closer racing. So it's exciting to watch as a fan. And they're able to also, if the tracks are kind of more man-made, more open, less in the trees, you can actually pan and cover that with way less cameras. So there's a reason why it's also gone this direction. And it's if we want the sport to, to grow and continue, then you have to have investment, you have to have TV, you have to do all these things to see it grow. So it's kind of been a little bit, I think, stuck in a balance. I mean, if if money was no object and we didn't need TV, and it was from a rider's perspective, I'm sure the riders would also agree. They'd love to go back to those kind of super technical, steep, gnarly stuff in the forest, mixed with some you know, wide open jumps and some cool stuff as well, but just a bit more of a a natural feel to it. That's certainly my personal opinion and it would be my personal preference. So it, it's tough. I think if I was to say, what, what could you do at this point? It depends if you want it to be successful and continue, you have to be able to showcase it and showcasing right. it needs to be out in the open. Speed looks good on TV. You lose. Let me ask, I'll ask you again. GoPro's just released their GoPro 9 and it's got live streaming on it. What if you had all the all the riders would live stream, you know, like because we're getting 5G probably next year. And uh, what about then? I mean, you that would be awesome. You'd yep. see a really cool aspect of racing, but it's still yep. not that same. You still watching someone's GoPro, you don't necessarily appreciate speed. You don't necessarily appreciate steepness of terrain. Yeah, yeah. You do yeah. need that outside perspective too to be able to watch a race from from the same angle from different riders to be able to see the difference in line, difference in speed. You'd lose a huge element just watching it from one point of view, I think the entire way. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a tough one because I think the sports in a, it's in a healthy place, certainly downhill at the moment in terms of um, the Red Bull coverage, people are loving it and we're able to really kind of follow it and, and see a, a lot of the tracks. So it's cool. I love watching it as a fan now. Um, but those guys are definitely pushing the limits and taking risks and, and going, going definitely fast. I, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I followed the, the accident of uh, Brooke McDonald last year and that wasn't in a necessarily really fast section, but when I was watching practice, I was just like, far out. When they came, I don't remember the track, but when they came down, like it was just so fast and so rough. And I was just like, man, if it goes wrong, it's going to go real wrong. And it's, you know, yeah. people can walk out of that. And funny enough, that monster and where it was, where he crashed, is where yeah. I won Worlds and was actually one of my all-time favourite downhill courses because it was, it had a good mixture of everything. And back in the days, it was that fast, open, wide open piece. And it's not changed hugely other than it's, it probably has got a bit fast because there's kind of more catch berms and there's certain stuff that's been manufactured, but it did used just to be a wide open, rough piece. And it was pretty mm. cool because it, it was a really fast course and I have to say, I still love going fast on a bike. So people yeah. still want to do that. Yeah, um, yeah. And it looks good on TV. So yep. No, definitely. Um, 
Did you live in Australia in 2008? I didn't live. I did... Um, you did a lot of work in Australia. Months. Yeah. yeah. You, uh, we did a New Zealand and Australia um, kind of escape winter, basically. And okay, nice. Came, came and did, spent some time in Canberra, raced a few of your national series. Um, and it was a little bit of kind of planning build up because obviously you had world champs in Canberra in 2009 there. Mm-hmm. So I was, and this was at the point in my career where I was like, I need to win this damn world title. It's been <laughs> getting so close. So I definitely came and raced Canberra the year before. We had a World Cup the year before and stuff as well. So um, yeah, I'm a big fan of escaping winter in the UK when, when possible, certainly when I was racing. Um, oh. So did a, did a few New Zealand winters and, a, and an Australian one. So it was, yeah, really cool. Oh, definitely. I, I've lived in Spain now for 10 years and we try and escape it every year. Like it's not always possible, but it's pretty good. The Spanish winter is not exactly bad either. Let's be honest. Oh yeah, but the Australian, <laughs> the Australian. If you can do the endless summer, it's better, definitely. <laughs> so, um, in your time in Australia, what was your favourite Australian word? Bogan. Bogan. <laughs> I don't know why that's just come to mind, but yeah. <laughs> bogan for everyone out there. A bogan is kind of like a chav in a way. Yeah, I guess so. I think it's more like just boy racer style, I was imagining. Yeah. Just like in their cool souped up cars cruising around the streets trying to be boys. Would that yeah. be a good translation? Or Yeah. yeah. Bogans, uh, it's actually pretty hard to, yeah. They have souped up cars. They generally don't wear shoes very often. Um, That's lots of you Aussies though. You know what yeah, you Aussies yeah. don't like shoes. I love all the, the signs in Australia. No, no thongs, no shoes. And no shirt, no entry. You're like, who's going out with no shirt and no shoes on? Oh, lots of Australians. <laughs> yeah, most people. <laughs> um, so you've travelled pretty much extensively the world bike riding. Where would be your favourite place, not to race, but just to go and ride, like uh, to hang out, enjoy the people, enjoy the food, enjoy the riding? Oh, goodness. Um... Come on, you know it all. We... It's too poor. many, too many good places. And again, yeah. I think the chance I've had to travel has been utterly incredible. Um, but it is still very much the the kind of similar kind of places. You know, it, I still have a desire to do some really cool kind of off beaten track travel. That's you know, we generally have been to mountainous regions, northern hemisphere m- mainly, I guess. So I think probably my favourite places have been either. Australia, New Zealand, or even Chile. I had some pretty cool trips to Chile and haven't done done loads there, but would love to experience more um, of that area. But I think my ultimate kind of riding destination, I still just get drawn back to the Alps, Swiss Alps, French Alps, just because of the mountains and the you know crazy little goat track, single tracks that like literally just skirt along the edge of the of the mountainside. For me, I just the most fun riding it doesn't have to be fast i love it when it's techy and slow and crazy hairpin turns you have to like hop around 10 times just to get around yeah um and yeah the alps for me are just stunning super stunning um and pretty special places to be able to to go and explore on your bike oh definitely okay so we are an e-bike channel let's talk e-bikes what was your first e-bike what's the first time you got an e-bike it would have been, it would have been a Trek, um, and the Power Fly. I want to say twenty seventeen, maybe eighteen. I mean, that's the thing. It's not really very long ago. No, um, no. But the change in, in just those three, four years is is crazy. You know, in terms of how the bikes have, have moved on. Um, now, what did you think of that bike? What What was your first impression of an e bike? That the first thing was it was just like I'm just cheating. That's exactly the first impression thing that everyone gets. It's like yeah. this is just it's cheating on bikes. Um why would I why would I want to ride an e-bike? What's it gonna do for me? Uh those first ones were probably I mean they're still, let's be honest, they're all still heavy in the relative scheme. So it's not like it's jumping on a you know lightweight race bike, which I spent years trying to get light bikes and get everything that's racing fast. Mm-hmm. So that kind of first feeling of it being heavy. But I think as soon as you then just like switch that button to turbo and off you went, it was like, wow, this is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, 
and it does open up doors and I think more so now with the kind of the journeys we've done with them carrying Toby my little guy on a mac ride on the front like the places we've been and it, I mean I use my e-bike now every day every day when he goes to nursery take him to nursery every time on my e-bike I go to the farm shop to get my milk on my e-bike it's like my it's like you my take car your ra- is that your race bike you take or uh, yeah yeah nice <laughs> yeah race bike <laughs> the mac rise got full mud guards it's probably uh up for winter yeah you have to send me a photo of that so you're you're riding a uh 2021 trek rail tell me yep. about what modifications you've done how you spec that bike for racing how different it is to a stock the stock rail so i mean the frame is is a stock frame there's no difference in terms of geometry or anything the only things that we've changed it's been um again depending on which rail you get this is full sram rock shock spec Mm -hmm. um with axis so i've got electronic shifting which is actually pretty nice um and just the whole like clean cockpit cable us you know um wireless dropper seat post so all the kind of nice nice parts of having top end electronic shifting which again for me that whole thing was you know electronic shifting for, for a while i was like this is crazy why do we need this but actually when you realize how how well it works and how pretty bomb proof it is it's it's great um and then just the only other things i've, I've changed bar and stem so it's got deity bar and stem which it wouldn't normally come with so it's just been componentry there's nothing hugely yeah. changed um depending on the course i'll change tires whether it's more of a downhill casing or a slightly you know lighter weight casing obviously running tubeless um which i don't think anyone would want on tubes now on an e-bike really be pretty crazy definitely not um did did you lift you've lifted travel up to like 170 180 on the rail so the fork the fork i've got is 170 yep so yeah it's just 10 mil i haven't gone any bigger than that okay Um, and yeah, I mean, I don't think there's. It's still the same Bosch motor. <laughs> there's no yep. no change. No, um, I, mean, I mean, I'm a I'm a massive geek for the e-bikes and the technology. And I think, I mean, Trek were pretty late to the game, but they haven't really had a good bike. But the rail, the rail's almost spot on. Like uh, for the geometry wise, it just looks really good. It looks a um, yeah very solid bike. I think I think well, they took a while because they've got the experience of that enduro race bike that you know yep. we've been i've been working with them for when i was racing on the kind of first 29 a remedy that they brought out with kind of it's, it's grown and changed and changed and now we basically just took a, a successful enduro bike and put a battery in it in, in essence you know obviously there's a lot more to it than that yep. but in terms of getting a, a good feel for riding you know an enduro race bike then um then that's kind of they've got the experience from making you know normal bikes so mm. I think now they have definitely got it right. And interestingly, now I feel like we're getting to the point where racing is becoming more serious than actually do we then start looking at race specific bikes and does it need to become lighter? Does it need to become, you know, uh, how, how do you make it lighter? Where's that weight position? You know, that, that's my next kind of challenge. Just like, where do we go with, with e-bikes and do we need race specific? doesn't need I mean, to necessarily have the biggest battery because that's not the challenge EWS. They give you, you're not having to battery manage. You can basically have a 500 watt battery and go on turbo and still make it round the loop. So lots of I, stuff. I think that for it to move forward properly, there needs to be more parameters put in place because like it is, it's really difficult because all the bike manufacturers have 700, 625, 630 or 500. And it's, and those frames don't fit. You know, it's kind of like, you can't just put another battery in. Um, yep. Yeah, it's a. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how it develops. Um, have you? I mean, I, I'm, might be. Well, I am going to be racing the EWS next year, the electric series. Nice, cool. Yep. Yeah, um, I sort of put it out there as a challenge to. I'll obviously be doing the amateur series. Um, and uh, have you? Did you play around with doing any mullet setup on that bike? No, I haven't at all. No. I haven't at all. It's uh, left it standard, and again, I think it's something that could be interesting. But again, it's it's more for me like a time specific. I haven't really done. I'll be I'll be honest now and say that this this year particularly, like those two races, was very much just like jump on the bike, let's go. I did the minimal amount of kind of time on my e bike. I definitely ramped it up because I got closer to those races and did mm. a lot more during that time. And that's why I think 
the first round I was I was second and was very well and truly beaten and I was like right I need to I need to step up my game here and a lot for me it was just spending more time on my e-bike um, and doing more specific training on that so there's lots more I could be doing um, again if if it was if I had the kind of time and the the energy to do and some of that testing would be quite interesting to do. Yeah, definitely. Um, we're, so obviously the EWS is pretty damn new. So we just finished our first year of the electric series. Where do you think it's going to go? Where do you see it going? And where do you want it to go? Um, I mean, I don't, it's not going to disappear. e are here to stay. They're here to grow. And I, I, my hope is that it will grow in a, in a nice manner alongside the normal bikes. I don't, mm-hmm. I'd like to see them not have to go off on two different tangents and become like their own separate race series. I'd like to feel like they, you could incorporate both into one race weekend. Um, and I know for 2021, that's the plan with the organizers is that they're going to sk- stagger the racing. So as it is possible for athletes to do both to race the e-bike and the normal bike over the course of one week mm. by not overlapping the practice. And also the, the idea is in, in the future to be able to um, also not overlap the stages. So actually the courses will be entirely different. That's the ultimate goal. So as you're not kind of having the same, and I think that's because you, you almost need a different challenge from the e-bike stages. You need to have a reason to have an e-bike and to make them potentially more physical with some more ups in. Um, they don't necessarily need to be so gravity fed. Um, so yeah, there's definitely some, some hopefully some exciting things that with the EWS as it grows. Um, and my hope is that it can just be seen as another form of racing. It's another discipline. It's not this like, there's still a lot of, I guess, negativity around e-bikes and how they're ridden, their need, are they ridden responsibly? What do we, is it going to change the dynamic of trail access and who access the trail? There's lots of things that I think still need to be worked on, and also tampering with them. You know, are people still riding at 25k an hour, or are they chipping them so they're going to go at 40 and 50? And is what's the responsibility of that? So there's so many aspects that I still think we are only just starting to kind of um, even start that kind of challenge or process and find out wh- where we go and how we manage all of those things. Mm. So. It's, ex- think, it's super exciting. I just hope it's, we can keep it in a positive light and in a fair and um, kind of t- inclusiveness and not have to break off into like its own separate kind of race series, really. No, definitely. I, I think what you're saying about de-restricting, that's, that's probably one of my biggest fears about the e-bikes is that, I mean, I get the question every day. Oh, who, what's the best company to, to de-restrict the bike? I was like, just don't de-restrict your bike. You don't need to. Like, if you're riding it properly and riding it in good areas, why do you need to go more than 25 k's an hour? You don't. Yeah. Um, and it's just going to, it, it, it could and it might lead to us getting banned riding in, in public places, you know, just yeah, like motorbikes. Sure. Yeah. Um, so next year I'm, I'm going to race. Uh, what advice would you have for me i think well it's always the classic like it, everything it's all about it is in your preparation so it, the more you can do in, in preparation in, in everything in terms of your fitness is obviously the, the most important but also making sure your equipment that you've got is you know how it performs in a certain terrain so testing making sure you're going to use the same tires you're going to use making sure you've you've tested your bike and you know what works, what doesn't work. You're not going to suddenly have a surprise when you get to a race and you, know, you start getting like, the punctures if you haven't been in that terrain. So just all sorts of preparation. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the things that I feel like, although they're only short loops with the EWS, they, they're timed. So even like your, the liaisons to get to your time stage is also tight. It's not like you can spend all day meandering there like, looking at the scenery. So that training needs to also be you need to be able to ride at a, a good pace consistently as well and not just mm-hmm. be like kind of ride with your mates all have a chat at the start of the trail then drop into your trail all have a chat at the bottom and then roll on like there needs to be no recovery and like almost try and rec- what's me recreate what a race would be like in your training so if you don't suddenly get a shock when you've had to go full gas to get to the start of the stage you've got six minutes to get your helmet on goggles faff go race get to the yeah. next one go again like there's yep. you need to be able to be ready for that um 
And I think that's an important part of it. Thank you. That's um, it's for me. I, I used to race BMX uh, until I was about 18 and uh, I was all right. I was a pretty good rider and uh, this would be kind of just interesting. I don't, I don't want to win. I don't want to, I don't want to even, you know, take it too seriously, but I want to be competitive in a way, but also I just want to do it because why not, you know, just to show that yeah. the, the average guy can go out there and give it a go. I think it's being I'm just, involved. I've just thought of one more thing that okay. would actually be your eating and drinking, so your nutrition. Oh, That's yeah. a key, key, key thing because it's they are actually going to be quite long days once you've done your three loops, you've come back, changed your battery, gone out again. And if you practice the day before, or you've got two solid days of you know maybe five, six hours on the bike. And if you don't hydrate and eat well enough on day one, by the time you get to day two, you're already dehydrated and undernourished. <laughs> So uh, one of the things that I used to do was like put a little timer on my Garmin or something. So every half an hour, I would make sure I eat, ate something and certainly drink more regularly than that, ideally. But if not every half an hour, there would be something going in multiple yep. you know, drink. And, oh, that's, and that's a key just because it's really easy to kind of get two hours into your ride and then be like, oh, I haven't actually eaten yet or drunk. And it's like, that's almost too late then. Mm -hmm. So, so for yet. you, like, let's say two or three months before the last EWS, what did your preparation look like? Uh, the last electric series, like, so a couple of months ago. Um, so I was still, I've still kind of had quite a, I would say, fitness based approach to, to the EWS stuff, even mm -hmm. though, um, because I'm still, I have been relying on years of downhill racing. So not feeling like I need to do loads and loads of technical training. I felt like it, the fitness was always the area that I was going to have to work on more. Mm -hmm. Um, so I still was doing road, some road riding, some cross country racing, uh, riding some training. And then the one thing I did a little bit of was, was some more upper body gym stuff. And I kind of wish now I'd even done more because that's one of the big things I realized from this year from those two races was there's a much more, there's a bigger stress on your upper body than there is on a normal bike because you're the weight of the e-bike. And certainly Zermatt race, there was a lot of rough Alpine descents and my arms and my hands particularly were in no way in the right shape to be able to deal with that. And for me to be able to ride at the level I wanted to, uh, my hands were so dead. I was just yeah. a passenger for like most of the day. Um, so the, the weight of the e-bike is key. So then the thing I did between rounds one and two was did way more sessions on my e-bike and okay. realized actually the only way I'm going to really get better at this is spending time on the bike that I'm racing on. So as much as that was technically, it was also just time on a bike that weighs more than a normal bike. Um, yeah. so some specific sessions on the e-bike and building that up. So that strengths there. And if I think maybe for guys, it's not such a big thing because you know, generally girls that we don't have that same upper body mass and strength you know in that naturally so i think we definitely have to do a bit more to work on that to, to balance that out so the first um the first time i took my my mount my e-mountain bike my decoy to a bike park um i rode the bike I, I rode the park really well i jumped everything i did all the black runs and i was like you know i'm good the bike's really good next day i couldn't move like i uh, my oh. whole body was just like I was like, what is going on? Like, I didn't feel it when I was on it, but you're, you're moving 25 kilos, 24 kilos. Exactly. And the weird thing was, like, at even the end of the, the, that second race in, in Pietro de Gura in Italy, like, I, I didn't, I wasn't tired in this. I was tired, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'll be lying if I said it felt easy because it didn't. But I wasn't the same fatigue that I would have had if I'd been on a normal bike. Like, I hadn't got that, like, leg deadness from like pushing watts all day on my bike because you don't mm. have that in the same way it's such more it's much more of an overall body workout and i like it's it's hard to explain but it's completely different it's completely different fatigue on your body and it's like you don't feel as physically dead from like the effort and from the mus muscular effort but it's just a, like a wrestling feeling <laughs> like you've just i agree totally you, you are days. fighting you're fighting the bike a lot um yeah. so you know it's not Every day I get to talk to someone like you. Uh, what uh, what would you eat before, during, and after a race? I know, like you, you said every half an hour, but like just a little bit more specific. Like, what would you would you do? Any sort of prepping, like a big carbohydrate meal the day before, or something like that? Um, no, not massive. As long as you, as long as you've been eating and drinking well, you shouldn't need to suddenly do a crazy big build. I don't think. Yeah. So I'm a big 
believer in like um breakfast has always been a big part of my my day and i'm a big porridge person so that's mm -hmm. a very traditional british thing probably but like some good solid carbohydrate meal with with some fruit and yogurt and stuff so just a good solid breakfast depending on when you're racing as well if you're racing real early then obviously that needs to be quite early so i always need two to three hours to like digest a good two to three hours like yeah if if, it, if i was going like full gas from the start if i know yeah. i've got like an hour of climbing or liaison to get somewhere that's fine you can get rid of that but if i was to go like xc race i would need three hours for sure i'd be feel terrible and, and then th yeah on the bike during the race is like so again if i back in the day when i had more time so cats in the way I see a cat um there. <laughs> Cats out the way. I would um I would prep quite a lot of food. So we used to do rice cakes, like make uh rice even with like bacon and egg or fig and honey, and basically yeah. like mix it all into your rice, put it in the fridge overnight. So you get little like rice bars because that's just yep. good good energy. And I also used to make little like sweet potato brownies or little energy balls. So like um almonds, cacao, raisins, okay. just like little all like. And tend to try and always do homemade stuff because you just know, you know that your body likes, you know what's in it. Uh, you're not lo having loads of extra sugar. You're getting good and and mixing that kind of like sweet and savory thing. Because if you just live on gels for six hours, your stomach is hating life by the end. Yes, you might get through it in terms of energy, but it's such, such a kind of direct source of fuel that it's like you get those peaks and troughs. Where I think the more you can just eat normal food and keep that balance throughout the day that's for me was always a good key and it's the same thing now when you're doing long days like that you just need to keep on top of and not spike yourself with crazy amounts of sugar suddenly and just keep it sensible i i did a it's called the dartmoor classic you might have heard of it it's like a, a hundred mile race in dartmoor in yeah. england and uh it was the first long race i ever did on a road bike and uh i went it was seven hours on the bike and I just had gels. And for the next week, my stomach was Bits. gone. I couldn't eat yeah. anything. I couldn't, it was just terrible. So yeah, yeah, I'll definitely be taking that advice. Um, so I've got, uh, so I really think right now, especially with the COVID that we're going through and the bike industry going like 300% up with the e-bikes, I think it's a proper e-bike revolution right now. Um, I know we asked the question about racing and stuff, but where do you see the, the bike industry as a whole dealing with the e-bike movement? Do you think, um, you know, we're still going to see a whole bunch of enduro bikes being sold or it's going to go more e-bike enduro or sort of how do you see that working? Um, I mean, I think the e-bike thing is definitely going to grow in terms of getting new people to the, to the sport. Uh, it's a complete leveler in terms of getting, you know, I think, I think people are going to start thinking about one, their health and exercise, but also their transportation. So I feel like that whole commuting world of how we use bikes is going to probably see where we see a massive growth, you know, people not wanting to get on public transport because of COVID and mm. the chances of contracting something from being too close to others. So I think that whole commute world is going to be big. And that's why wouldn't you use an e-bike if, if you're commuting to work? Like if you had the choice, because exactly. when you just get there faster, you won't be quite so sweaty, hopefully. Um, so it makes sense. So I feel like that's going to be a huge growth, but I also, I don't think we're going to lose that kind of racing side either. People who get into the sport, there's always going to be a percentage of those people that want to take it further and want to race and they're competitive. So we're going to get new people into the sport. Some of those are going to trickle through to racing. Okay. Not masses. It's not going to be a huge surge, but I think it will just continue to grow. And as more people become more environmentally aware, as well as their health reasons, there's another good reason to, to, to ride bikes. So I really think we're in a pretty exciting place now for the bike industry as a whole. Um, and I think both bikes are going to continue. I don't see we're going to get, I don't think we're going to get overtaken by e-bikes because the real out and out races and, you know, people that want to race and really test their body, they're going to want to do it without, without e-power. So mm, it's sure. going to be a month for both. And also you um, you run like a, a junior support team or something that uh, you... Yeah, uh, so, yeah, Timo Racing. So yep. I started off a little program, how long ago now? Eight, six, seven, eight years ago, probably. Um, mm. And it was more just for local kids, basically. We have got a really good local scene here. So I wanted to kind of give something back and, and um, yeah, 
help out where I could. So that's how mm. it started. Well, it's good. I, I think, uh, well, especially my wife and a few of my friends' wives, they have been getting more curious on the bikes, on the e-bikes, because it seems like such a, my wife came for a couple of rides to me and she's like, oh, you know what? It's actually kind of fun, you know, like uh, that, because the entry to the sport, you know, like you don't need to be that fit now. You can get in there. You know, so like my question would be like for younger or older women, what, what advice would you have to try and get into the sport? For me, it's the biggest and most important thing is having a group of people around you. It's that community. It's that belonging. It's that community feel. So like whether it's a local club, whether it's just a group of your mates, if you've got a a social reason to be part of that group and you've got something in common and actually you can ride bikes, catch up, have fun, gossip, have a laugh. You know, that's the most important thing. And certainly for women, I think that's a big driving force is to be able to have that social side of it as well and to have that group dynamic. And I think that's the the key is to find local people to ride with. You know, I still love riding on my own and I still, lots of people like to, when you get started, you want to, want to share that fun and you want to, you know, have fun with it. And I think that's the, the easiest way to start is to have to be accountable to others as well to say hey we're going to ride at nine on sunday and even if the weather's horrible you know that someone's going to be there at nine so you, you get yeah. out the door and you go and do it and that's the most important thing i think very good all right some cheesy questions now if you could have a billboard at the end of fort williams like right at their finish line what would it say like to inspire me to get to the finish or just no like, like uh, just to you know, like for the audience to see, for you to say, like just sort of, it can be inspirational, it can be a Trek advert, anything. Oh my. Big question. Uh, <laughs> Easy question, I know. Yeah. I've never thought of anything like that, but I I would guess it would probably for me would just be a big smiley face because yeah. ultimately bike riding is fun. Why else would we do it? And yep. if you've just done a race run down Fort William and you've gone as fast as you can, it's it's a pretty cool thing to do. So just like a big have fun smiley face factor would probably be the, the thing I can think of. Very good. And uh, for, I mean, there's a lot of people that are starting e-bike riding at the moment and it's something like 30 or 40% of new e-bikers are new to the sport in total. Um, if for uh, 200 euros, dollars or pounds or less, what is something they could buy that would make their riding better or uh, improve their experience on a bike? For me, a helmet, like a good quality bike helmet yeah. is a no-brainer. No-brainer, there we go. <laughs> yeah. um, like that's the most important thing to, to look after your head because, yeah, we only have one. Um, the other thing I probably would say on top of that is – a nice good pair of chamois shorts if you've still got some change in your 200 euros yep um because that's a comfort thing and the yep. point of contact helmets gloves saddle and shoes like those are my things that like good shoes that are either fit well grippy if you want flats something nice to sit on something nice to hang on to and something to look after your head like those are my important things and maybe something for the more performance orientated like uh Something that's, you know, the stock bike comes out of the shop. What's something that you would definitely change that, that you always um, change on your bike? Probably tires, if I'm honest. Yeah. Because they tend to be specced with like fairly cheap, lightweight, not great sticky rubber, like hard compounds. And mm -hmm. that can transform a bike is actually having good tires. Most definitely. What do you, what's your go-to tire for racing and training? What would be your your main setup so we i mean again most most sponsored riders you don't necessarily get a choice you get to use whether it's who you're sponsored by but obviously trek yeah. has bontrager is their tire tire brand so for me racing wise now it's either a g5 so it's like a downhill um yeah. tire or an se5 so it's a slightly lighter weight casing and the, and the se tires were what i use for for enduro um with the e-bike now i think the downhill tires are more, more important because you just need you, a heavier bike. You don't need to worry quite so much about weight. Um, mm -hmm. And also it's slightly softer rubber. So you get a, a, probably a bit of an attraction. So, so yeah, G5s and are probably my go-tos um, until it gets really muddy and then it'll be a muddy spike. But okay. And are you running inserts front and back or just back? 
Um, back, I would say not almost all of the time, and then depending on the conditions, the front as well. And I use a flat tire defender, which is a US company that make like a one I've used even when I was not on the e bike. Um, nice. And as much as it gives you that puncture protection, it also gives a really like amazing subtle supple kind of feel almost like you've got plush travel on your suspension so i love i love using them and now on the e-bike when you're not worried about weight so much like pretty much use them all, all the time so do you does that mean nice. you drop your tire pressure so what so with the yeah with the tire defender so that's what it's called the flat, flat tire defender flat, FTD. flat tire defender um what yeah. tire pressure would be running front and back on that i probably again Hugely depends on the course, but if I can get away with it, probably like 16, 17 PSI front. And then if I could get away with it again, 20, 22, 23 on the rear, Pretty always well, like yeah. more on the rear, yeah. less on the front. Um, yeah. But again, if it's super rocky, then obviously that would go up. But yeah. quite a lot of the kind of muddy, muddy kind of conditions in the woods at home, you can run pretty low and still get good, good performance. Nice. All right. One last question. The last one. Are you ready? I'm ready. Perfect day. You've got a downhill bike. You've got an enduro bike. You've got an e-bike. You can hang out with anyone. You can be anywhere in the world. Where are you going to be? And what bike are you going to ride? I have to say right now, it would have to be my e-bike because it means it can transport my family. Yep. Uh, I can take Toby. James, my husband, can come too. And we can go and have a cool day as a family in the mountains and having a picnic somewhere high up on the hills um so it just means that it's an inclusive thing it doesn't take forever to get there toby we can be on the bike we can do it as a family so that's that's why at the moment that is my yeah my bike that does everything because it allows us that inclusive nature of it it's cool that's that's a perfect answer that's what we want to hear very good magic <laughs> well tracy thank you so much for your time and uh, if you want to thank anyone your sponsors or anything now now's the time now's the time but yeah i mean just a, a big thanks to trek they've been kind of in my side since 2009 racing downhill and then into my enduro career and and now kind of give me the chance to race but also alongside working for the team and being able to put back into the the teams that i work and run with so it's yeah it's cool to still be part of the part of the sport and being able to have my input and still enjoy the world that I've grown up with. So big thanks to them. No, it's, it's absolutely amazing. And I, I love the fact that, you know, you're out there racing again and it's, it's really, I mean, it's good to see. And I think it's, um, well, I'm very excited to see it next year and get a full year and see how it goes and also see how you go with a little bit more practice. Like yep. you did pretty well yep. this year. So <laughs> next year, look out. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and writers, if you have any questions for me or Tracy, put them in the comments and I will do my best to get them answered. And writers, stay safe out there and we will see you next week.